Do do di. It's Nandi. Hello, friends. Morning. It's Nandi, and I'm back again with another video. I'm sorry for the relative delay since my last bit of content, but I've been a little bit under the weather, and you might be able to hear the remnants of a croaky voice as I speak. Today's video is going to be on character abilities and specifically which abilities to invest in. As usual, I'll have timestamps and chapters so you can skip ahead to the relevant sections and I'll provide gameplay footage and descriptions detailing why I would recommend the things that I do. The first thing I wanted to do before I got into that video was do a big shout out to a viewer of mine called Greycon. Greycon, I play Tacticus with your dad in the same alliance and he mentioned to me how much you enjoy my videos and love Shozo. I wanted to just give you a big shout out and hope that you and your dad can continue to make many happy memories together playing the game. A core part of Tacticus is tied into character progression. You have finite resources that you earn by playing various game modes and you want to spend them wisely in order to upgrade the right characters. This then allows you to defeat more content, earn more resources, and complete the cycle by upgrading more characters. The topic of ability upgrades factors into the upgrade character part of this metric. You want to spend resources widely and effectively in order to maximize your progress. Ability badges rank from common to legendary, and they are used to upgrade character skills, both the active and the passive skills. As you can see on screen, you need 12 common badges, 21 uncommon through to epic badges and 64 legendary badges in order to max a specific skill. Ascending your character, for example from epic to legendary, also gives your abilities a further 20% boost. The important thing to note is that abilities follow a non-linear scaling pattern. As you can see on screen, leveling from 16 to 17 gives you a much lower increment in damage or benefit versus leveling from 47 to 48. Therefore, it's much better to focus on a specific skill and take it as high as you can, rather than spreading your resources thinly and evenly distributing your skill badges. Let's go through things and talk about each category in turn. I've broken down my recommendations into two categories, a sort of main priority, which I believe you should focus on and you will get high yield from throughout the game, and then the sort of secondary priority where you can spend badges if you have extra resources, but they're not necessarily the top, top choices. For Xenos, I'll take you through each of these in turn. Now, if you've been a follower of my channel for a while, you'll know how much I've been harping on about Eldrion and his passive Doom. Eldrion is the most powerful character in the game for guild raids, and we know that guild raids are very much considered end game content. They reward more resources than any other game mode, and particularly are a resource for character orbs, which are currently a big bottleneck in the game. Doom makes Eldrion the most valuable raid character in the game, and I think by extension, the most valuable character overall. Sync your badges in here if you want to make good progress. In this clip, you'll see Eldrion working in tandem with Bellator and Tiark. Both characters' damage are outlined on screen, relatively low initially, However, when Eldrion moves into the frame and applies the 2 hex Doom debuff, you can see how both characters' damage increases quite a lot. Bellator more so because of the more hits applied. The next recommendation is Onshi's active. What it does is it recharges another character's active and is best used in guild raid with characters like Bellator or Yarrick. Here you can see in the video how Bellator's active is recharged to create loads of summons and overload the Tyranid boss and really stack your damage numbers up. The final Xenos ability that I would recommend investing heavily on is Inescapable Accuracy. Now Morgan Ra is the best character in the game to pair with Eldrion in guild raids. His passive works optimally when you can leave him stationary so that he gets a bonus to his crit chance and crit damage. Initially, it can be a little bit tricky to learn optimal positioning, but once you have experience with the bosses and their movements, you can often stick Morgan Ra on one hex for the majority of the battle and really see his damage output skyrocket. Morgan Ra is returning for his final run of his legendary release event later on this month, and I'd recommend checking out my YouTube channel for my other video which gives you some tips and tricks to unlock him. We now move on to the secondary priorities for the Xenos factions. Onchi's passive is Serene Unifier. 
That describes a rotating aura that gives different benefits on each turn of gameplay. Now you're already bringing Onchi to Guild Raid for his active, so I'd recommend building up his passive at least a little bit so that you get some secondary value, particularly from the aspect of his rotating aura that gives bonus damage to surrounding allies. The next Xenos character that I would recommend building is Athena's passive, Path of Command. As I've spoken about in the past, a key to success in guild raids is using a combination of characters that have multiple hits as well as characters that do bonus damage through their passives, and Athena is a good example of that. Her passive gives bonus damage as well as bonus crit chance to affected allies and is therefore a good damage buff option that is relatively easy to acquire. In this clip you can see Morgan Ra and Eldrion facing off against Gazgul. Morgan Ra shapes up to do around 6000 damage. However, as Athena moves into the frame, you can see that she's now applying her passive aura, Path of Command, to units within two hexes. Morgan Ra's damage has accordingly skyrocketed to 10,500. The final Xenos ability that I would recommend building up is Aleph Null's active. Now, Aleph Null has a unique swarm mechanic that allows it to survive against Mortarian's aura. As you'll see in the video, despite Mortarian's aura destroying most things in melee, because swarms require multiple hits, they are actually one of the few things that can survive and potentially lock Mortarian in place. In addition, Aleph Null is an all-star in the Necron campaign. Sticking points into Aleph's active is going to give you good output in that section of the game as well. We then move on to the middle child in the game at the moment, the Chaos factions. At the moment I wouldn't recommend building any of the Chaos characters with a particularly high focus as I don't think any of them have really really good value in guild raids. Now that might change in the future, but as I've spoken about already I think you should maximise resources and focus on characters that are going to give you yield in guild raids because that's where you're going to see the most value for money. In terms of secondary priorities, so these are characters that you can stick some badges in but don't go crazy, we can look at Archimatos and Volk. Archie's active and passive allow summoned bloodletters to help you progress through the Chaos campaign, and they have some use in Guild Raid, particularly against the Psyker bosses. Something I've seen players do is use Archie's active to create lots of demons, and when those demons die, you're allowed to use Yarrick to summon more guardsmen on a sort of follow-up salvo. The same principles for campaign progression apply to Volk's passive. He can be a big damage dealer and have some utility in guild raids due to his multi-hit ranged attack. The next character and a particular favourite of mine is Angrax. His passive, Hateful Assault, puts him in probably the top 5 characters in the game in terms of legendary unlocks. Even if his use is limited to a few traits due to the unique nature of legendary events, by placing him next to a spawn point and having a high enough passive, you can often breeze through entire levels without too much difficulty. We then move on to the Imperial section. There are more Imperial characters in the game than Xenos or Chaos, and therefore it makes sense that there are more recommendations here than the other two factions. I won't go through everything on this list, but I'll touch on what I think is most noteworthy. From a main priority point of view, I would very highly recommend building Bellator's active, Death From Above. Each summoned interceptor has 6 hits, making him among the best characters in the game to take advantage of other damage boosting effects, such as Eldrion or Kalgar or Ithana. Now it's worth noting that summons cannot crit, but they can still take advantage of static damage buffs as outlined just previously. Bellator also works very well with on Shi, and a double active timed well can really get out of control very quickly and allow you to pin certain bosses in place, such as the Tyranid bosses. This then has knock-on effects on characters like Morgan Ra, who then no longer need to move and can maximize their passive abilities. The next character for the Imperial section is Kalgar. Kalgar's passive Rites of Battle is possibly the second best damage boosting effect in the game after Eldrion. The two work in tandem with one another, and Kalgar works particularly well with Imperials, such as the popular Bellator, who is already a fantastic choice for guild raids. On to the secondary recommendations. Top of the list is probably Kalgar's active, Gauntlets of Ultramar. Now, if you're bringing Kalgar for his passive bonus, which you should do if you have him unlocked, 
then you might as well use his powerful active. Every boss in the game summons minions in some capacity, and therefore having a high level active allows you to clear through those minions essentially in one turn, letting the rest of your characters remain focused on the guild boss. The next recommendation is Roswitha's active, Brazier of Holy Fire. Now, this active is the most powerful skill against Mortarion, who's the newest and hardest guild raid boss. At level 46, it adds a 20% damage boost for two turns to your team, and is therefore particularly useful against this lethal raid boss. This next secondary recommendation talks about both Helbrecht and Roswitha's passive. Both cause them to deal bonus damage against Psyker targets, which make them specifically useful against the Tyranid guild raid boss. Now it's worth noting that Helbrecht's passive only applies to his damage in melee, whereas Ross with us passive applies to both her melee and ranged attacks. The distinction here means that Roswitha can also be used against Mortarion, whereas Helbrecht tends not to be as useful due to the lethal nature of Mortarion's damage aura to melee attackers. We can talk about Thaddeus Noble's passive ability, Spotter, next. Thaddeus already does the most ranged damage in the game against endgame legendary bosses, who we know have roughly 600 armor after their primes have been defeated. It's therefore a no-brainer to invest in Thaddeus' passive, which synergizes extremely well with Morgan Ra, who's another automatic inclusion in endgame raid content. In this clip you can see how Morgan Ra's damage is initially 3600, but once Thaddeus repositions to apply his bonus aura, Morgan Ra's damage jumps to 9500. Isabella's passive, Medicus Ministorum, is a nod to Isabella's usefulness in legendary events. A popular strategy using Isabella is to turtle her in one corner of the map and then surround her with tankier allies so that her passive automatically heals them and you're able to grind through waves and waves of enemies. Next up is Ulf's passive, Savage Killer. Now Ulf is possibly the best character in the game against Karudius Prime, one of the lieutenants for the Mortarian Guild Raid boss. His passive chops away at the summoned enemies before they're able to attack, and having a high level Ulf will allow you to make a huge sense in this boss and his prime. The final Imperial ability that I wanted to touch on is Celestine's passive, Gemini Superior. Celestine is the strongest PvP character in the game due to this unique passive ability that allows her to be protected from direct damage for the initial attacks. It single-handedly negates Overwatch and provides her with incredible mobility across the map due to her resilience. There you are. A short list of characters for whom I believe you should prioritize their skills in order to make efficient progress in the game. Thanks for watching and I'm sorry the video was over my usual 10 minute target. If you've enjoyed the video and would like to continue to support me and my content, I'd appreciate if you use my refer a friend code on screen. It earns you 100 Blackstone and supports me and allows me to continue doing the work I do. Finally. If you'd like to join a new guild or a cluster of active and engaged players, please reach out to us in Pants of Horus. We've recently made the big step of expanding our cluster to a 20th guild, and we'd love to have you on board in our fun and friendly community. That's all for now, folks. Thanks, bye. Doo -doo -dee. It's Nandi.